In a previous video, we had a rather funny alternative definition for the Bessel functions. We had this uh, generating function, which is a function of x and t, which is exponential x over 2 t minus 1 over t. And then we said if we expand this as a Laurent series with powers of t, and going from minus infinity to plus infinity, then the expansion coefficients will be a function of x, and namely they will be exactly the Bessel functions of the first kinds of order n. So this is what we had last time. The question is, can we use this particular definition of the Bessel functions here to come up with an explicit series expansion for the Bessel function itself? Well, what we could do, for example, is write our generating function as a product of two exponentials. So we have exponential x t over 2 times exponential minus x divided by uh, 2t. Now what we could do is, okay, we know the series expansion of the exponentials, so we could basically have a product of two series expansions here, and then write this in this particular form where we collect all of the factors of t, and then what we end up with we can identify as uh, the Bessel function of order n. So this is going to be our strategy, trying to write a series expansion for this and identify then j n of x. So pause the video and make use of the well-known series expansion for exponentials and see if you can indeed come up with an identification for j n of uh, x. So what is the series expansion of an exponential here? So for our first factor we have, well, let's call the summation index, uh, let's call it r. So we have the sum of r going from 0 to infinity. And then we have 1 over r factorial. And then we have the arguments of the exponential to the power r. So this is going to be x over x times t over uh, 2 to the power of r. And then for our second factor, well, it's again an exponential, so we can also write down something very similar like this. We have 1 over r factorial, and then we have the argument of the exponential to the power of r. So that's minus x divided by 2t to the power of r. Okay, so this is what I've written down. Pause the video and see if you're happy with what I've written down, or is there something that I'm doing wrong here? Let's uh, think about this. Uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, doing the following, which is writing the first series expansion as follows. So we have 1 over r factorial and then xt2 to the power of r. And strictly speaking, there's also nothing wrong with, with that thing here. However, when we start to take the product of these series expansions, if we use the same symbol r for the second series expansion as we use for the first series expansion, then we will get into trouble because this particular r here has nothing to do with that particular r. They can evolve independently from each other. But if you use the same symbol for both, then we just join them at the hip, and that's not what we should do, right? So if we do it like this, we will be hopeless, hopelessly into, into trouble. So we should have a second independent summation index here. Um, and let's call this S. So let's say we have S running from 0 to infinity, 1 over S factorial, minus x over 2t to the power of s. So this looks a lot, a lot better here. Pause the video, expand the product of these series expansions so that we can finally figure out what jn of x is. Good luck. Now, our end goal is to come up with something of the following form. So we have sum of, of something, and then we have a certain power of t. Let's call that t to the power of n. And then we have something here in between brackets, and this is going to be our j n of x. And 
in all likelihood, this thing will be a series expansion of its own. So what we need to do is when we evaluate the products of these two series here is we need to collect all the same powers of t. In this case, I've called this here t to the power of n. But you can see that we will need to do a substitution where here we have t to the power of r and here we have t to the power of minus s. Basically, we need to introduce a new variable n, which is r minus s, um, which will now impose a relationship between uh, r and s. They're no longer independent because they're joined through this uh, separate variable n here. And then rather than expressing this in terms of the variables s and r, which are independent from each other, we're going to express the sum um, with summation indices n. And yeah, then we could choose either r or s, but let's just choose to get rid of r and express this sum as a sum of indices n and uh, S. So pause the video and do just that. So what we're doing here is actually taking the product of two series expansions. And that's not so straightforward if you're not used to this. So in order to help people that are perhaps not so familiar with this, Let's take a small detour um, and take the product of two very simple series expansions. We have first series expansion that only has two terms. And then we have another series expansion that is likewise just as boring, just consists of two terms. And then hopefully I'm not surprising you by saying that this is a naught b naught plus a naught b1 plus a1 b naught plus a1 b1, right? Okay. Four terms. We can actually represent these four terms in a graphical diagram like this. So say that on the horizontal axis we have all the summation indices for A, uh, which in our case are 0 and uh, 1. And then on the vertical axis we have the summation indices for B, which is also 0 and 1. And then you can see that these four terms, we can represent them by having these four uh, crosses here in our A, B plane. And we obviously need all of these four terms when we expand this. Now, when we will have uh, three terms times three terms, we will have nine crosses in our diagram. But what we're actually dealing with now is a situation where we have infinite terms times infinite terms. So now our diagram has a summation index R here. Let's put that on the horizontal axis and S on the vertical axis. And we will actually have an infinite set of infinite uh, crosses here. So it looks something like uh, this. And it is important that we take care of including all of these crosses in our resulting uh, expansion of the product of the, the two series expansions. And this also immediately makes it clear that why it's really important to have a separate summation index R and S because if we had called them the same name uh, R, for example, then we would only have included these diagonal terms in, in, in our series expansion where R and S are equal. And then we would have forgotten an infinitely number of terms, which are, of course, uh, very important also. So uh, this graphical representation makes that more obvious why we really need two separate summation indices. So in order to make sure that you have all of the terms in the product of your series expansion, you need to have some systematic way of, of uh, yeah, following them, of taking them all into account. So you can say, okay, first I put s equal to 0, and then I have r running from 0 to infinity. And then I put s equal to 1, and then I take all of those, and I take all of those then. Or you could do it the other way around. I fix r, and I have s running from 0 to infinity. So these are different ways of making sure that you account for every possible term here. You could also start grouping terms which will end up with the same power of t. And this is exactly what we want to do here because we are looking at a new summation index n is equal to r minus s. So let's just in this diagram illustrate where we have contributions to a certain value of n. Let's start by looking at when do we have the situation where we end up with the power n zero? This is going to happen when r is equal to s. So all of these crosses on this diagonal here will give us n equal to one. Where do we have, uh, sorry, n equal to zero? 
I was getting ahead of myself because next question to ask is where is n equal to 1? Well, here, for example, we have r equal to 1 and s equal to 0. So this indeed will give us r equal to 1. So all of these guys will give us n equal to 1. This will give us n equal to minus 1 and so on. So here we can come up with a different strategy of making sure that we do not forget any of these terms. We could first run n from uh, minus infinity to plus infinity. And then for each value of n, make sure that we have all of the correct contributions, that we have them all uh, accounted for. So pause the video and see if you can explicitly write down what, uh, for a given value of n, the limits of s are. So to make sure that we don't forget any term, we have n running from minus infinity to plus infinity. And then the question, the question is what will happen to s? s will run from what value to what value? Well, there's a subtlety going on here because it will depend a bit on the sign of n. If we first look at situations where n is 0 or bigger than 1, so this is, for example, this line or that line, and then you see if we start here, the lowest value of n that we take into account is 0 here, so n will run, s will run from 0 to infinity. Also here, when n is equal to uh, 1, s will run from 0 to infinity. So for all positive diagonals, if you want, s will run from 0 to plus infinity. But unfortunately for negative values of n, it's a bit more complicated because let's look at what happens when n is equal to minus 1. Then the first value of s that we have is 1. If s is minus 2, then the first value is minus 2. So in general, if we have a negative value, s will run from minus n, which will be a positive number, from minus n to plus infinity. So the lower bound of s is a little bit complicated and depends on the sign of, uh, of n. But nevertheless, this will allow us to rearrange the terms into a form that will make it easier to identify a certain coefficient of a certain power of t. Because what we're going to do is we will have n running from minus infinity to plus infinity, and that will collect all of the terms that have this certain power of t. And then just we, we just group what we have left. Then for each value of n, we have s running from this complicated lower bound, which I have no space for to write down, to plus uh, infinity. And then we just take a look, if we go back to our uh, form over here, here we just make the substitution where we have r equal to n plus s. And if we do that over here, and if we factor out the powers of t, then uh, we end up with uh, 1 over r factorial, which is going to be n plus s factorial. Um, then we have x over 2 to the power of n plus s, used to be r. And then we have 1 over s factorial. Then we have minus x over 2 to the power of s. Okay, so we're starting to get where we want to be because remember this guy will be our uh, Bessel function. Um, one thing which is personally bothering me from an aesthetic point of view is this very complicated lower bound here. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we were just able to say that the lower bound is zero and be done with it? But if we pretend that the lower bound is zero, then this means that we should also include this term in our series expansion and that term and that term. And of course, we shouldn't do that because these terms are not part of our original series expansion, are they? But uh, if we happen to look at the coefficients that we have for, for a certain cross here on the, the, the negative side, um, let's see what happens, for example, for the case where n is equal to minus 1 and s is equal to 0. So if we were to pretend that we also include this point here, it's n minus 1 and s 0, what is then the coefficient that we need to fill in here? And more specifically, the value of 1 over n plus s factorial. This is going to be 1 over, well, minus 1 factorial. 
Yeah, what on earth is minus one factorial? You might ask. Well, there is a way to generalize factorials to all sorts of funky numbers involving uh, gamma functions, which we're not going to talk about here. Uh, but the nice thing about that expansion is that a factorial of a negative number is either plus or minus infinity. So you could say that the coefficients that we end up when we have negative factorials here in the denominator, they don't matter because they end up being zero anyhow. So we can safely replace the lower bound by zero, adding these extra terms here because the terms are zero anyhow. So this allows us to simplify this lower bound a little bit. And after that final cosmetic operation, uh, we can just identify what we have here in square brackets as being the series expansion of the Bessel function of the first kinds of order n. So let's just collect here some terms. This is s from 0 to infinity minus 1 to the power of s divided by n plus s factorial. And then we have another s factorial. And then we have x over 2 to the power of n plus 2s. And here we have it, starting from our definition using the generating function, we found a series expansion of the Bessel function. And this is something we can use to numerically calculate what our Bessel functions look like. And if we then plot them, so if this is the x-axis and then we plot the Bessel functions, uh, the first uh, order, sorry, the zero order will look something like, like this. So this is j0, this is 0 and 1. And then j1 will look something like this. And then j2 will again look something like, like this. Okay, it's a very approximate uh, representation. But you see that these Bessel functions, they are sort of like oscillating, um, but they're not periodic. That's very important. The distance here between these zero points turns out to be non-constant. Uh, non also interesting to remark is that at the origin, all of the Bessel functions are zero except for j0 here. And this is something that you can easily derive by looking at the, the series expansion here. Because, so if you want to figure out that j0 of uh, 0 is indeed 1, well, what happens at the origin? You have basically x here raised to a certain power. If you raise 0 to a certain power, that's always going to be uh, 0, except, except in the case where you have 0 raised to the 0th power. Uh, that has to be 1 for consistency reasons. Now, when do you have 0 raised to the 0th power? When you have n equal to 0. So that's, this is the only case, the only situation where you will end up with a non-zero contribution when you have the order of the Bessel function equal to 0. So now we finally know what our friends, the Bessel functions, look like.